This program is about a poisonous gas called hydrogen sulfide. In the program, you'll be shown where hydrogen sulfide comes from, what some of its properties are, how it may affect you, how it can be detected, and some suggested steps to take when it is detected. But keep in mind that exact policies on how to handle hydrogen sulfide may vary from one company in one location to another company and another location. Also, many states have requirements for working around hydrogen sulfide, and these requirements are reflected in company policy. So always check with your supervisor for specific information and instructions. But there is some important general information you should know. For example, hydrogen sulfide is also called H2S, sour gas, sulfurated hydrogen, and rotten egg gas. But whatever you call it, it can be deadly. Where does hydrogen sulfide, or H2S, come from? To find out, look at a cross-section of several underground rock formations. The red, green, and blue is a rock formation called a reservoir. It contains gas, oil, and salt water. Enlarged in the box at right, you can see the gas in red, the oil in green, and the salt water in blue that are in the spaces or pores between the individual grains making up the rock. Sometimes, but not always, poisonous hydrogen sulfide gas, or H2S, may be mixed with the gas, oil, or water in the spaces between the rock. When a well is drilled into a formation that contains H2S gas, the H2S may be circulated to the surface in the drilling mud or in other fluids being circulated, such as air, gas, oil, or water. When the drilling fluid reaches the surface, there are several places on the rig where H2S may be released. One place is at the bell nipple. Another danger point may be the mud return line. Other places where H2S gas could break out include the shale shakers, open mud troughs or ditches, the mud tanks or pits, or any other part of the mud handling system, including the mud pumps the intake and discharge lines, and the standpipe and rotary hose where leaks may occur. Once H2S breaks out into the air, it can be very dangerous, but with training and knowledge, you can safely deal with it. To help you deal with it, you should know about the properties of H2S. H2S is a gas that is heavier than air, because it weighs more than air, it can settle or accumulate in low places, especially if there are no wind or air currents to move it away. So be especially alert for H2S in low or enclosed spaces, like in the cellar and other low areas under the rig floor. There's nothing wrong with your projector. This is what H2S looks like. That's right. It has no color and is transparent. You cannot see it. But H2S will burn and explode in air. When it burns, it produces another dangerous gas called sulfur dioxide, or SO2. In small amounts, H2S stinks. Many people say it smells like rotten eggs, but you cannot depend on your sense of smell to detect H2S. The trouble is your sense of smell can be deadened by H2S. You might be able to smell it for a little while, and then you'd smell nothing. As a result, you could think that there's no more H2S to worry about, when really you should be taking steps to protect yourself. Now let's cover the effects of H2S. What H2S does to you when you breathe it depends on two things. 
the length of time you breathe it, and how much H2S is in the air you're breathing. For example, a heavy dose of H2S knocks you unconscious almost instantly. If you're not removed to fresh air and given artificial respiration, you could die or suffer brain damage. A smaller dose of H2S breathed in over a period of from 3 to 15 minutes may cause your eyes to water, your chest to tighten or burn and make you cough. Also, your skin may itch or tingle. Tables are available that tell you the physical effects of hydrogen sulfide. This one, for example, gives the concentration of H2S in percent and in parts per million, PPM for short. At right, the physical effects on humans are given. When there's one thousandth of one percent of H2S in the air, or ten parts of H2S per million parts of air, ten ppm, you get an obvious and unpleasant odor. Actually, you can smell H2S in concentrations a lot less than ten ppm. Also, the table says that at an H2S concentration of two thousandths of one percent, or twenty parts per million, you're safe for eight hours of exposure. However, this figure for eight hours safe exposure may vary with local regulations and company policy. So check with your supervisor for the safe concentration figure you must use on your location. At one hundredth of one percent, or one hundred ppm, H2S kills your sense of smell in three to fifteen minutes and may sting your eyes and throat. Long-term exposure to this concentration may knock you unconscious and lead to death. At two hundredths of one percent, or two hundred ppm, H2S kills your sense of smell shortly and stings your eyes and throat. Again, long-term exposure to this concentration can knock you unconscious and lead to death. At five hundredths of one percent, or five hundred ppm, H2S causes dizziness, causes breathing to cease in a few minutes, and a victim needs prompt artificial respiration to restore breathing. At seven hundredths of one percent, or seven hundred ppm, a person is made unconscious quickly, and death will result if not rescued promptly. At one tenth of one percent, or one thousand ppm, a person is knocked unconscious at once and will die within minutes if not rescued. There is no doubt about it. H2S can be very dangerous. If workbooks are available, stop the tape cassette and work exercise one. After working the exercise, return to the second part of the program. Now, let's see some ways you can protect yourself from H2S. Earlier you were told that H2S is heavier than air and therefore tends to accumulate in low places like in low-lying ground areas or in low or enclosed spaces like in the substructure of land rigs. Of course, H2S can still be dangerous even if the space is high up and open, like up on the rig floor where H2S could come out of the drill stem. But H2S is especially dangerous in low and enclosed areas because it is not dispersed as readily by wind or air currents. However, there are safe areas. Remember that the wind easily disperses H2S. So if you face into the wind and move away from the well bore or rig in the direction you're facing, you'll soon be out of danger. Also, if possible, try to go uphill since H2S gathers in low spots. In other words, to escape, move upwind and away from the wellhead. But never go toward the wellhead, even if it is upwind. You'll be moving right toward the likeliest source of H2S. Of course, to move upwind and away from the well bore, you have to know the wind direction. This is where wind socks and streamers can be helpful. Also, bug blowers, fans, can be used to blow H2S away from an area if the wind is calm. 
Further, drilling contractors and companies that drill in H2S areas can plan the location to obtain maximum safety benefits. Whether offshore or on land, one of the things a company may do is set up briefing areas or protection centers. A briefing area is a designated safe place where personnel can assemble to receive instructions during an H2S emergency. As pointed out by the large arrows, one at the top center and the other at bottom left on this well site diagram, there are usually two protection centers or briefing areas. In this way, one protection center will always be located upwind from the well bore, but check for the specific locations on your rig. Also, plans can be made to ensure that the weight and condition of the drilling mud is such that it will counteract any kick that might be received from H2S gas pressure. In addition, an H2S neutralizer can be added to the mud that may help in preventing H2S from reaching the surface. As further protection, automatic sensors or monitors, like these two pointed out by the arrows, may be used to detect H2S if it does break out of the drilling mud. These monitors are placed at the shale shakers. Sensors can also be placed at the bell nipple, mud tanks, and other points where H2S may occur. If H2S is detected, the sensors trigger H2S warning alarms. This particular alarm has high intensity lights and a very loud siren. Usually the sensors are set so that the alarms go off before the amount of H2S is hazardous. This way you should have plenty of time to take proper action to protect yourself. In addition to automatic detectors, several types of handheld detectors are manufactured. On this particular unit, pulling on the handle draws a measured amount of air through the glass tube. The tube is filled with granules that turn dark if H2S is present. Ask your supervisor to instruct you on the use of detectors that may be on your location. Many types and brands of safe breathing equipment are available for protection from H2S. Breathing equipment gives you a supply of fresh air to breathe. Basically, the types of breathing units can be divided into three categories, escape units, work units, and rescue units. This is one brand of escape unit. Escape units have a small self-contained air supply and are designed to give you enough air to reach a safe area in the event of an emergency. If escape units are available on your rig, you'll receive instructions on how to use and care for the particular brand and type of unit you may have. These men, working a set of power tongs on the rig floor, are wearing one brand of work unit. Work units allow you to continue to work safely in an H2S environment. This unit, like most work units, has an air line to a face mask. The other end of the line is connected to a breathable air supply stored nearby. This unit also has an auxiliary self-contained air supply, the small yellow bottle on the man's back. The auxiliary air bottle for this brand of work unit is worn on the hip. The air lines you see trailing out behind the men are connected to the remote air supply. Should the men have to disconnect from the remote supply, the small bottles will provide them with an emergency self-contained supply of air. Since there are many different brands and types of work units available, you will receive training on the type that may be provided on your location. This is a rescue unit. Rescue units provide a self-contained supply of air that is carried in a bottle on your back. Most rescue units provide about 30 minutes of air, but the time may vary with the way you breathe, the work you're doing, and so on. A rescue unit gives you a portable air supply and can be useful when carrying out rescue operations or when it isn't practical to use a work unit. If rescue units are provided on your location, you'll get instructions on their use and care. If you have long hair, 
sideburns, beard, perforated eardrums, glasses, or contact lenses, they may affect proper mask operation. So check with your supervisor. If workbooks are available, stop the tape cassette and work exercise two. After working the exercise, return to the third part of the program. Now let's cover some things you should do if H2S is detected. Suppose an H2S alarm goes off. Perhaps, as in this case, a light starts to flash. There are certain actions your company will expect you to take. As an example, one set of suggested steps is go to the designated briefing area, put on your breathing equipment, and await further instructions from your supervisor of course, your company may have steps different from these, so pay heed to the requirements on your rig. Usually, you'll have advance warning of H2S, but if there is a sudden release of the gas, then these steps are recommended. Do not panic. Hold your breath. Put on your breathing equipment. Help any person in distress and go to a designated briefing area. Naturally, if your company requires different procedures, follow its instructions. In any case, knowing what to do before an H2S emergency makes it easier for you to take the right actions without panic. This is where training and practice really pay off. During any H2S emergency, be on the lookout for persons who may have been overcome. Start rescue procedures immediately. Your supervisor is the one to check with for detailed rescue and first aid procedures, but here are some general things to follow. First, always put on your protective breathing equipment before you try to help someone in distress. Otherwise, there will be another person in distress, you. Second, move the victim to a place where the air is safe to breathe. Act quickly. Seconds count. Third, if the victim is not breathing, start giving him artificial respiration and call for help. Here's where your first aid training can come through for you. Devices called resuscitators can also be valuable in first aid treatment. A resuscitator gives artificial respiration automatically. It gently forces oxygen into the victim's lungs to help restore his breathing. Check with your supervisor for information and training on the resuscitators that may be on your rig. And of course, your supervisor should be notified if someone is injured by H2S. If necessary, he'll see to it that arrangements are made to evacuate the victim to a hospital. Of course, the best treatment for H2S is preventing accidents from happening. To keep from becoming an H2S victim, always put on your protective breathing equipment if you must enter an area that is suspected to contain H2S. Develop the practice of watching out for each other when emergency conditions exist. When possible, work in pairs. Use the buddy system. As mentioned before, one of the many types of handheld detectors can be useful in making tests for H2S. During an H2S emergency, do not remove your breathing equipment until tests indicate that the air is safe to breathe. H2S is a deadly gas, but you can work safely around it if you take proper precautions. Recommended practices for safe handling of H2S are available. Automatic alarm systems can be installed. There are many types of safe, reliable breathing units. There are several kinds of handheld H2S detectors. Signs can be posted to warn you when there may be danger from H2S. Emergency numbers or radio contact procedures can be posted so medical personnel and other authorities may be contacted if needed. 
But when it's all said and done, one of the most important factors in H2S safety is you. You're the one who's responsible for using the training you receive so that you and the rest of the crew can work safely when drilling in H2S country. If workbooks are available, work exercise three.